In the northeastern high desert of Arizona sits a most peculiar sight. Thousands of petrified logs sitting on the desert floor, hanging out of cliffs, and peeking out of the soil. Where did they come from? Why are they here? How did they petrify? How do they fit into the biblical worldview of Earth's history? Just farther west is a huge crater etched into the desert limestone and sandstone. With evidence for volcanism around the area, many early scientists thought that it was an ancient volcano. But evidence later revealed that this crater was caused by a large meteorite hitting the Earth at an estimated 40,000 miles per hour just a few thousand years ago. Scientists have used this crater to identify other meteorite craters around the world. But did something like this cause the demise of the dinosaurs like so many secular scientists believe today? All this and more next on Awesome Science. Awesome Science takes you on a field trip to some of the most amazing geologic and historical sites around the world where we use the Bible as our history guidebook to interpret what we see, that the Bible can be trusted, and empirical science falls in line with the biblical account of creation, the fall, and the flood. Science, it's awesome. The Painted Desert in northern Arizona is a remnant of a vast dry lake bed, one of many lakes that stretched across several western states after the flood. This area is part of the Grand Staircase, a 10,000 foot deep section of sedimentary strata, starting at the top of Bryce Canyon in Utah and ending at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Much of this area was formed through water by the laying down of layers by water and then eroded by water. Much of this area is in the Shinley Formation, which is in the lower middle of the Grand Staircase. It's an amazing area full of geologic sites. It's been thought to have been formed over millions of years, but there's another story that better explains the features we see. Using the Bible as our historical authority, we see in Genesis 6 that God sent a flood to destroy the whole earth. The fountains of the great deep burst forth and it rained for 40 days and nights nonstop and culminated in a year-long flood. The bursting forth included water and volcanic activity as continents were broken apart. Water covered the whole earth for about a year. As the continents moved under the water and slowly came to a stop, mountain ranges were quickly pushed up. Water from the flood rushed off the continents, eroding valleys, but some water got trapped in large inland lakes between the mountain ranges and plateaus. Even after the floodwaters receded, volcanic activity continued, then eventually slowed down due in large part to continental movements minimizing and the earth equalizing after this great catastrophe. The landscape of the entire Southwest shows evidence that there were two large lakes that existed eastward of the Kaibab Plateau. Many creationists believe these waters breached and became the source of the catastrophic flow which drained quickly through the Kaibab Plateau to carve the Grand Canyon in a matter of days. Much of the Shinley Formation contains volcanic ash laid down by water. This volcanic ash came from volcanoes erupting, for the most part, underwater during the flood. When it mixed with sand and mud, this huge layer was deposited along with logs and dinosaurs. Volcanoes continued to erupt around this area even after the flood, as evidenced by volcanic flows of basalt on top of these layers. We're here at Petrified Forest National Park. Behind me here are petrified logs, haphazardly scattered around. Scientists here say that they are millions and millions of years old, but in reality, they're all a part of Noah's flood. Petrified Forest National Park is just 124 miles east of Flagstaff, Arizona. This Navajo and Apache land has an average height of 5,400 feet of elevation. Thousands of petrified logs lie on the ground, mostly broken apart into rounds. 
A few full-size logs lie on the ground. Others hang halfway out of cliffs, and some peak just above the surface. Also in the park are hills of amazing colors. They are made from ash layers that formed underwater. It all screams catastrophe. In 1962, this area became a national park because of its unique features. 50,000 acres were set aside for the public to come and examine Earth's history. Park signs say that this area was formed 225 million years ago. But is this accurate? This date comes from a belief in evolution and millions of years. So how do we view this in light of the biblical account of Earth's history? According to the biblical record and genealogies, we can determine this area is only about 4,350 years old, formed at the time of the flood. Everyone agrees these logs were transported in and by water, laid down here, then fossilized. But the mechanism for how they got here and how long the fossilization took is where the difference lies. You either believe in long ages, which is held by those who believe in evolution, or just a few thousand years, according to the Bible. Let's see what the facts show us. First of all, the root balls on these logs are very small or just absent which scientists see as evidence that the original trees were ripped out of their original location in a cataclysmic event. Think Genesis Flood. During the flood, massive amounts of water rushed across the land, uprooting much of the vegetation, including large trees. The logs floated on top of the floodwaters for a while, but eventually sank to the bottom and were buried quickly by the volcanic sediments. The bark has been stripped off, so something happened to cause the bark to be knocked off. During catastrophes like Mount St. Helens, we saw something similar. After the 1980 eruption knocked down trees, logs floated below Mount St. Helens on Spirit Lake. They rubbed against each other, and eventually the bark fell off before the logs began being deposited on the bottom of the lake. During the flood catastrophe, we expect nothing less. Where the bark fell is most likely different from where the logs rested. Because the rock layers here in the Petrified Forest National Park do not contain any coal, where bark is commonly found in coal layers. We can see growth rings in the logs. They are large. The original trees would have grown up in a very healthy environment which is what we would expect before the global flood. The environment back then was definitely better than today, but still suffered the effects of the curse. Due to volcanic action, the water was surely heavy with silica, and when the logs were buried, the silica-rich water would have petrified them. Why is this significant? Well, when the logs were buried, the carbon would have traded places with the silica in a chemical process called permineralization, and the logs were quickly fossilized. Signs in the park will tell you it took a long time for these logs to fossilize, but with the right conditions, such as a global flood, it could take less than a year. One lab has been able to duplicate this process in just days. Now that's repeatable science. Also, in Yellowstone National Park, scientists experimented with putting logs in silica-rich water. And in less than a year, substantial fossilization occurred. Since this area continued to be underwater, even after the flood receded, these logs stayed buried for a while. In a few years or less, the large inland lakes wore away at the limestone in the Kaibab Plateau, and a massive erosional event occurred where the Grand Canyon was carved in just days. When the Grand Canyon formed, some of these layers at Petrified Forest National Park were exposed. The exiting water eroded through these layers, exposing the petrified trees and creating the teepee, geologic features. Much of the desert floor is clay, which mostly came from volcanic ash during the flood. Some probably came from volcanic activity after the flood, 
But in some places, like Jasper Forest, the stumps are buried in sandstone with pebbles. We call this a conglomerate layer. When a rock layer has pebbles, it's usually a sign that fast-moving water was involved to round the pebbles. This gives us another indication that water action was responsible for creating what we see here today. It's interesting that we find entire logs here and not just bits and pieces of them. Researchers realized that entire forests were swept away in one large event. The global flood makes perfect sense. Remember, don't sample or take any pieces of petrified wood. The park rules say no, and we need to keep things like this for future generations. One way for us to verify our theories on catastrophic forest destruction, floating log mats, and petrification is looking no farther than Mount St. Helens in southern Washington state. In 1980, Mount St. Helens had a huge eruption causing the north side of the mountain to slide into the valley below, resulting in the largest landslide in recorded history. The landslide pushed into Spirit Lake and caused an 800-foot high tidal wave on the opposite hill. The wave was so huge that it pulled down the entire forest of large mature trees back into the lake in less than a few minutes. The logs covered the top of Spirit Lake in one large log mat and many are still there today. The logs rubbed together and the bark sunk. Over time, thousands of logs became waterlogged and sank to the bottom of the lake. Eventually, up to 20,000 logs have sunk to the bottom of the lake and the layer of bark has formed into a layer of peat. Sonar tests and scuba expeditions have verified these facts. If Mount St. Helens were to continue to erupt and fill Spirit Lake, all of the logs would be buried in peat, silt, and ash, which would naturally have silica in it. Eventually, the logs would fossilize. If exposed at some point through erosion, this area at Mount St. Helens would look much like what we see at Petrified Forest National Park, and even the numerous levels of apparent petrified forests at Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone National Park. Even if secular scientists don't like the conclusion, this is evidence for catastrophic processes like the Genesis Flood that helped carve many of the geologic features we see around the world today. Driving along, you'll see steep cone-shaped hills, which are called the teepees. They are made up of volcanic ash. At the top of the Shinle Formation, their shape is the result of water erosion. In August, it is monsoon season in Arizona, where afternoon storms will drop as much as one to seven inches of rain in 15 to 30 minutes. The ash and clay erode quickly when this much rain falls over a short period of time. The brilliant layers in the Shinle Formation indicate that they were created by catastrophic means. How? Let's look at the evidence. Indicators are that these volcanic ash layers were originally deposited underwater. It was not a local event, but huge. In order for the same colored layers to stretch out for extreme distances, Noah's flood, just 4,350 years ago, is an ideal candidate for a catastrophe on such a massive scale. If it was a smaller event, then the layers would be more sporadic. The different bands of color are due to different episodes of underwater volcanic eruptions. Every volcanic eruption puts out different materials, some coarse, some fine. So one layer is never the same as the next. When eruptions happen underwater, such variations are even more diverse because the water will also carry other sediments, which will mix in with the ash. Slow and gradual processes would have laid down these deposits with no uniformity. But if they were laid down by water rapidly, one after the other, the layers would be uniform over long distances and large areas. Rapid layered deposits and erosion are not a fairy tale. When catastrophic processes are at work, amazing things can happen. Back at Mount St. Helens, 
The 1980 eruption blasted the volcanic ash and debris to the north, piling ash layers on top of the initial landslide debris. When finished, the valley floor had risen hundreds of feet. Then, in 1982, Mount St. Helens erupted again. But this time, the crater contained a large amount of snow and ice. When the eruption happened, the snow and ice melted. The water breached the large earthen dam formed by the crater rim and carved huge canyons near the crater then continued to carve into the blast zone deposits below. All this erosional action happened in just a few hours. One of these canyons has been called the Little Grand Canyon because of the similar erosional features we find in the Grand Canyon. These erosional features have allowed scientists to view the layers laid down by Mount St. Helens during past eruptions, as well as the 1982 eruption. What they observed was different layers of ash, pumice, and mud laid down rapidly, some by airborne processes, some by water processes. What surprised scientists the most was that the strata showed independent multiple layering during the same eruption. Even in the hurricane force spread of deposition, independent multiple layers were made alternating between fine grain and coarse materials. Mount St. Helens helped researchers realize how a catastrophe like the flood can develop independent multiple layers in the strata as well as large erosional features. This should make anyone question whether catastrophes have occurred in the past. So when someone thinks that geologic features took long periods of time, this should immediately be questioned. The ash layers and the TPs at Petrified Forest National Park could have been created quickly over vast areas of the Southwest. It's just here that the layers were exposed, then weathered away into these fantastic formations. The Bible can be trusted in what it says about catastrophic processes not long ago in Earth's history. And researchers are realizing this the more they study catastrophes and geologic features. Many dinosaur fossils have been found in Petrified Forest National Park, along with the fossilized logs. This area obviously had a lot of catastrophic deposits during the flood. Signs in the park describe this area's past as a temperate rainforest where the dinosaurs lived. But there's little evidence to support this theory. Secular scientists point to the fossil fauna to support their story, but all evidence points toward the flood. For instance, all the strata are sedimentary rocks laid down rapidly by water. It was not an ancient forest floor. The deposits indicate quick deposition, including the ash beds in the TP formations in the park. The dinosaurs were not living here millions and millions of years ago, but were buried here quickly in sediments during the global flood. Petrified Forest National Park is a testament to the destruction of the earth and God's judgment against sin in Genesis 6. There's evidence for quick burial of trees, global flood action, and large-scale volcanic activity, both underwater and after the flood. We found other catastrophic action at Mount St. Helens on a smaller scale to demonstrate how these trees were uprooted and deposited as well as how layers can be produced quickly when the right conditions exist. We see that the Bible can be trusted as an accurate book of Earth's history. It is not a complete history, of course, but a selected history to give us a big picture look of the past. Northern Arizona is home to the Grand Canyon, Lake Powell, the Painted Desert, and many other geologic wonders. In addition to catastrophic processes due to the global flood, there's one formation in the desert floor that has fascinated scientists for decades. It's a crater in the Kaibab Formation, the top layer seen at the Grand Canyon. The crater is 4,200 feet wide and 750 feet deep. Due to all the volcanism in the area, it was once thought to be a volcano. But after scientific research, a whole new model emerged. 
Here at Meteor Crater, Arizona, a 150 foot in diameter meteoroid slammed into the Earth, creating this gigantic crater we see here. Not long after the formation of the Grand Canyon, an asteroid weighing approximately 60,000 tons impacted the Earth at around 40,000 miles per hour. Because of what we know today about the Earth's atmosphere and the heat experienced during entry, the asteroid was most likely much larger out in space. In the 1960s, Dr. Eugene Shoemaker studied this crater, which led him on a worldwide search to find other impact craters. To his surprise, he found hundreds around the entire Earth. Some say that a meteorite like this, only a hundred times bigger, crashed into the Yucatan Peninsula, causing the extinction of the dinosaurs. Think again. They say the meteorite would have created a gigantic dust storm that would have wiped out all the plants, thus wiping out the dinosaur's food source. The dinosaurs around the Earth would have starved to death by lack of food, then buried in dust. But there's one major problem with this idea. We don't find dinosaurs buried in dust layers. We find them in sedimentary rock layers. Clay, sand, and dirt. Which means flood action, not a gigantic dust storm. Another proposed idea is a meteor crashed into the ocean, causing tidal waves and acid rain, destroying life on the planet. But what does the evidence really show? In the early 1900s, Daniel Berenger, a mining engineer and businessman, came across this large crater. Geologists told him it was volcanic because of all the evidence for volcanism in the area. But he had a different opinion. He believed it was an impact crater from a meteorite and began to perform research to show that it was. He didn't do his research for science, but for profit. If it was a meteorite, being a mining engineer, he knew that fragments, or even the meteor itself, would be extremely valuable and profitable if sold. Meteorites are known to have high iron and nickel content. When iron ore is mined from the Earth, it typically yields 65 to 70 percent iron. But when nickel ore is mined, you're lucky to get 1 percent. A meteorite will typically contain around 92 percent iron and 7 percent nickel. A large meteorite could be sold for a very large amount of money. So he began to try and find this one. He first thought he'd find it in the middle of the crater. That's logical. He dug down 700 feet, but came up empty. Instead of giving up, he changed his plan of attack. Then he theorized the meteor came in at an angle. So he drilled into the rim. Berenger and his team went down 1,300 feet, found a few fragments, but not the big payoff of a meteorite. Yet, it was enough to convince him that it was a crater caused by a meteorite impact, not a volcano. What makes Meteor Crater so cool is that there are few large craters so visible to the public. There are a hundred or more of these craters around the Earth but we can't see them because they are eroded and obscured in a tropical rainforest or on the ocean floor. Meteor Crater is on the high desert of Arizona with nothing to hide it. It's almost a mile wide and 750 feet deep. That's as long as two and a half football fields. With the meteorite coming in at approximately 40,000 miles per hour, it caused a huge explosion on impact. Because of this great speed, most of the meteorite vaporized, leaving the crater and just small fragments scattered around. We're here at a friend's farm to make our own impact crater. With me is my grandpa. He's gonna help me supervise us firing a real gun. No, this was my father's pistol, and it was his survival pistol when he flew in air reconnaissance in the Vietnam War. It's a 32 caliber automatic. Never do this without supervision. Yes, never. We'll be firing into the dirt, which will be about the same conditions as when the meteorite hit the earth in Arizona. The 
The velocity of this bullet is about 1,000 feet per second, but meteorites can travel as much as 50 times the speed of this bullet. Now that's quick. This is our impact crater. In Arizona, most of the meteorite disintegrated as it hit the ground. But in this one, let's see if we can find any remains. Here's the copper jacket of the bullet, and there's the lead inside. Science, it's awesome! Signs at the crater say that this event happened around 50,000 years ago. But according to the genealogies in the Bible, the Earth is only around 6,000 years old. And God doesn't get things wrong. We know this event had to have happened after the water receded after the global flood because it sits in a high desert aloft the sedimentary rock. So this puts it less than 4,350 years ago. How do we know? This area is a part of the Grand Staircase, a 10,000 foot section of Earth made up by sedimentary layers laid down during the global flood. After the flood receded, researchers have pointed out that two very large inland lakes, three times the size of Lake Michigan, we're here in the early stages after the flood, trapped between the mountains and the plateaus. In just a few years, the lakes wore away at the limestone in the Kaibab Plateau. When the water finally wore through, it carved the Grand Canyon in just a few days, emptying the lakes and leaving this area as a high desert. Knowing that the Bible says the flood ended around 4,350 years ago, and that these lakes existed after the flood, and the craters sitting aloft the sedimentary layers. So it might put this event at Meteor Crater between 3,000 and 4,000 years ago. But we can't be dogmatic about it. It's just a guess. In the early 1960s, Eugene Shoemaker began to visit this area to study the crater. Studying impact craters was his passion. He studied craters at atomic test sites in Nevada and spent time at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff to study crater impacts on the moon. He hypothesized that meteor impact craters are much more numerous than anyone previously thought. To him, meteor crater was not an anomaly. Based on his research, he proposed that there could be other craters around the world, and he began searching for them. He discovered how catastrophic processes like meteorites and nuclear bombs create shatter cones, evidence for the shock of a meteor impact. Then he used this evidence to test other craters around the world. He not only found impact craters on the continents, but also on the seafloor. Some of these craters have been found in the Chesapeake Bay, as well as the Yucatan Peninsula. He helped to train astronauts to study craters on the moon. He was even a candidate to go to the moon, but could not because of his health. He is the only person who has his ashes buried on the moon. His widow, Carolyn Shoemaker, continues his work to search for meteorites in space and impact craters here on Earth. Because of his research, we now understand so much more about how the Earth has been impacted through catastrophic meteor impacts. Did a meteor impact cause the death of the dinosaurs? Let's look at the facts. There are many ideas on how the dinosaurs died, yet most of them seem to skirt around a global flood concept, even though most of the evidence supports it. We know the dinosaurs were buried in sedimentary layers, which means they were buried by water. Any other theory that doesn't include water just doesn't stand up. If the dinosaurs died on land, then their bodies would have decomposed or been eaten by scavengers. If they died in the sea, the same process would have consumed their carcasses. But all evidence shows that they were quickly buried in sediments such as sand and mud. When we use the Bible as our history guidebook, we see the mechanism of a global flood. This would have been the cause and the means for the quick burial of the dinosaurs. But the Bible also tells us that God brought two of every land-dwelling, air-breathing animal on Noah's Ark, which included the various dinosaur kinds, estimated to be around 50. Any animal outside the Ark would have perished in the flood. As we already mentioned, 
Some secular scientists have proposed an immense dust storm caused by a giant meteorite hitting the Earth, blocking out the sun and dwindling their food supply. The dinosaurs simply starved to death. But these impacts should have affected the whole world's animal population, but they didn't. Furthermore, dinosaurs were dying out after the flood, which tragically reduced their numbers, of course. Other ideas say a meteorite hit the ocean near the Yucatan Peninsula, causing giant tidal waves and acid rain to fall, killing off the dinosaurs. Yet none of these ideas can adequately explain what we see except for a global flood. The Bible can be trusted as the true history book of the world. The Bible's explanation makes perfect sense of what we are observing. We even expect meteorites to impact the world, being that it is sin-cursed and broken. But as creationists, we don't look at the evidence first. We start with the Bible, trusting that it is God's true word. Then we interpret the evidence through the Bible. We form our worldview through the Bible and use it to interpret all the evidence. We let God be the ultimate authority on the subject and go from there using the milestones he has revealed in the Bible. Secular scientists look at the same evidence we do and interpret it differently because of their worldview. They don't trust in God or his word as the ultimate authority. So by default, man becomes his own authority. This is where the debate rages between these two religions, humanism and biblical Christianity. This is why there will always be a difference in what is thought about Earth's history. It's not just based on the evidence, but our worldview. It shapes the way we look at the evidence, as though we're wearing a certain type of glasses. So, do we trust in man's opinion or God's word? We trust in God's word. God was there at the beginning. He made the world. He destroyed it by a flood, showing he has the power to judge. He promises to destroy it again, this time by fire. But he promises salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Meteor Crater reminds us that the earth is not immune to catastrophic destruction from the heavens. A group of scientists are concerned about this and continue to watch the heavens for meteorites heading to earth. When we look at the rocks in this area, Evidence for a global flood is all around and God's judgment was indeed a reality. Showing that the Bible can be trusted as a true book of Earth's history. And there will be another coming judgment, and this time by fire. God means business with his judgments and is calling people to repent. As we look at Meteor Crater, it gives us a glimpse of what God can do. When we see the flood sediments all over the world, we see what God can do when people do not repent. Even so, God sent a means of salvation from the flood with the ark. All people had to do was enter through the door and be saved. God is going to judge the earth for its rebellion once again. Yet, because of his great love, he has provided salvation for all of those who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. A door of salvation for those who enter through him to be saved. Have you repented of your sins and come to Jesus Christ? We invite you to come to salvation today.